emphasize it is not the war or the consequent supply shortages that have caused the price increase. The inflation that occurred is not because there was less wheat in the global supply or there was even less fuel products, oil in the global supply. Both of them, the supply has not changed. And this is something that the media doesn't tell you. Right? So it is completely a myth that it was supply shortages in food and fuel that created the price rise. It was profiteering by large companies, agribusinesses, fuel companies, and it was speculation in commodity markets. It was property tax on everyone, including relatively small wealth holders. Somehow that's allowed. Somehow that is not a problem. That's not difficult. Financial uh, assets are much easier to count. Yet we have no such notion of taxing financial assets. So there is a huge, this is really political will. There is no other explanation for the lack of, let's say, wealth taxation. Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Lab. Today we are delighted to have with us Professor Zerti Ghosh. Professor Ghosh teaches economics at the University of, Massachusetts, University of Massachusetts Amherst, USA. She has authored and edited 20 books and more than 200 scholarly articles in the field of development economics. In March 2022, she was appointed to the UN Secretary General's High-Level Advisory Board on Effective multi Multilateralism, mandated to provide a vision for international cooperation to deal with current and future, future challenges. Most recently, she has received the 2023 Galbraith Award from the Agriculture and Applied Economics Association. Professor Ghosh, welcome to India and Global Lab. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Emerging economies around the world have been facing sovereign debt crisis one after another. We hear about Pakistan as the most recent example. And you have been writing about these epidemics of sovereign debt crisis. Can you tell us the source of this crisis? Who are the lenders and what's the sort of broad uh, structure of international lending? So, you know, this is the more complicated debt crisis that we have had actually since over a century, really, because it is one that involves many different kinds of creditors and many different kinds of debtors. So uh, it's very much the result of a process that began as long as 30 years ago with financial liberalization across the world in both advanced economies and developing countries. And this was done to encourage developing countries, now you think of it, really, to take on more debt to tell them that, well, look, you don't have enough domestic savings, you need more investment to grow rapidly, and now financial markets are enabling you to access credit, which you couldn't have in the past. Otherwise, it was really aid, foreign aid and bilateral credit, and maybe some commercial bank credit, but more to the relatively richer countries or those who had natural resources, okay? So then you got financial liberalization in the 90s and 2000s, and you had this huge amount of money, especially after the global financial crisis, sloshing around the globe because the advanced economies did very, very loose monetary policy, right? Low interest rates, massive liquidity expansion. So there's this money looking for an outlet. And so they start lending to emerging markets, as they're called, mm -hmm. emerging because they were not earlier able to access these capital markets. And then later, frontier markets, which are the ones that were completely not able to access. So all of them were enabled and encouraged to take on more debt. And of course, you know that when these countries take on debt, at the slightest hint of any problem, it could be domestic, it could be international, it could be interest rates in the north. Capital tends to move out. And that's really what's happening. So Fed's tight monetary policy is one of the major reasons why capital has shifted back to the north. Um, and this is tied to the inflation. So if we can uh, discuss that a little bit, because inflation has been in the news. Uh, Paul Krugman wrote an article, I remember, in the New York Times, uh, writing right after the failure of the sovereign uh, 
sorry, the Silicon Valley Bank and saying that it was massively related to the short term fluctuation rate. But let's uh, keep with the emerging economy. You, along with Professor Chandrasekhar, have recently written that Fed's monetary policy is doubly perverse for the global South. Can you give us a big picture about why emerging economy, economies repeatedly face the problem of stagflation and balance of payment crisis? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, developing countries have had this tendency for, if you like, debt cycles and crises uh, now for a century. But the latest one, this phase, is really very much that developing countries have been, if you like, the collateral damage of macroeconomic policies of the North. So after the global financial crisis, you had a massive increase in liquidity. So from very high debt levels, you got even higher debt levels across the world, within the US, within Europe, but also across all countries. And as I mentioned, there was this money looking for uh, outlets. So riskier areas are seen as more profitable because you can actually get returns, higher returns. You can demand higher interest rates because it's risky. And of course, interest rates were low and almost negative. So it was, it was costless in that sense. And for developing countries, accessing this credit was also seen as costless because it was often lower than the rate of inflation in their own countries, mm. right? So IMF, Davos, everybody encourages them to take on this debt. Now what happens first, you have the pandemic. Now in the pandemic, in fact, the advanced economies, once more, they did what they like, right? They, they didn't bother about the implications for the rest of the world. So they said, okay, we're going to do huge fiscal expansion. So you've already had massive monetary infusion. Now you get fiscal expansion, the like of which we have not seen. Even the FDR New Deal did not have this kind of massive fiscal expansion. You, so, you have said that 80% of the fiscal uh, stimulus during the pandemic was from the developed nations. Just 14 countries. Just 14 countries account for 80% of that. And the US more than half. So you can imagine how the the low and middle income countries actually spent less than they had spent after the global financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And the low income countries, I mean, the fiscal expansion was pathetic, tiny, because many of them had to repay their debt. So they couldn't. And everybody was worried about capital flight if you run large fiscal deficits. So they still faced fiscal constraints. The rich countries didn't. So one is that they had a slower recovery and less recovery from the pandemic. In fact, many economies still haven't recovered. In India, employment levels are still below what they were before the pandemic. So there was lower recovery. And then it's a much more febrile kind of global economy. Capital markets are much more tense and nervous and looking around for the slightest problem and so on. Then you have the Ukraine war. Now, I want to emphasize, it is not the war or the consequent supply shortages that have caused the price increase. The inflation that occurred is not because there was less wheat in the global supply or there was even less fuel products, oil, in the global supply. Both of them, the supply has not changed. And this is something that the media doesn't tell you, right? Mainstream media will keep saying, oh my God, shortages because Russia is such a big... Uh, producer and Ukraine is such a big producer. The only thing that actually the supply fell is fertilizer. Mm. Otherwise, everything else, the supply remains the same. Okay, Russia continues to export more. So it is completely a myth that it was supply shortages in food and fuel that created the price rise. It was profiteering by large companies, agribusinesses, fuel companies, and it was speculation in commodity markets. Now, this has actually now been documented. More and more people are recognizing it. Even the IMF has recognized it. So this means that this was driven by cost increases. Okay, so there were some increase because of the commodity price speculation and the uh, profiteering. There was some increase because there were supply chains and uh, issues in things like electronics, automobiles. So those prices went up. But developing countries were hit by food and fuel in particular. Because remember, fuel enters into everything else. It's a universal intermediate. You raise that price, all costs will go up. Yes. And uh, so you have an inflation that is driven by cost increases. Instead of trying to address the cost increases, 
the response has been that, no, we will actually tighten monetary policy. And so we will create a suppression of demand because you're assuming that it is too much demand that has created the inflation. That is not true anywhere outside the US where you can say demand played a role because of the massive stimulus. Right. Everywhere else, it's not true. Nonetheless, the standard policy response has been to raise interest rates. So once again, collateral damage. Five percentage point increase in interest rates in nine months. That's unprecedented. So it's true, and interest rates are too low, but you don't increase at that rate dramatically. Mm. So global capital comes back to safety to the US and right. Europe. And it means that developing countries that were getting some credit now suddenly don't have access to that credit. At the same time, they have to pay more for imports. At the same time, their own exports are having difficulty. The currency, so, currency also is seeing depreciation. Currencies inevitably will depreciate because capital will flow out. You're not able to get foreign exchange through exports or tourism or remittances. So it's a triple whammy. If you like a multiple whammy, you know, in from every side you are hit in a way. And in that context, it's not surprising that so many countries are facing that difficulty. Because during the pandemic, they had a moratorium. Basically, they said you don't have to pay for the next year, year and a half. Okay, but that doesn't solve the problem. It kicks the can down the road and the can gets bigger. So now that that moratorium is lifted, countries are finding they just cannot pay. So there is no write off. There was a sort of short moratorium which has been lifted off. Exactly. It was just a kind of rescheduling of the debt payments. And that is not a solution, especially when so much of this debt is frankly now unpayable. One of the things told, I mean, with almost a little bit of frenzy during the crisis in Sri Lanka, that uh, the People's Republic of China is uh, the sort of this, uh, you know, laying out debt trap everywhere. Can you tell us a little bit about who are these creditors, who are these lenders in the international yes. building sector? The big change in the global debt situation has been the a massive involvement of private creditors, not China. But China, yes, China is a very big creditor. And that's not a bad thing because it was giving bilateral loans to countries at relatively low interest rates, certainly lower than others. And a lot of it was long term. OK, it but went even... into infrastructure, I guess. Mostly. Yes, yeah. yes, mostly yeah. infrastructure. And of course, now the accusation is that a lot of that infrastructure was white elephants, you know, um, sort of uh, uh, what are they called? Um, projects, the vanity projects and so on. Right. You know? uh, in Sri Lanka, certainly there were some of those, but there were also other infrastructure for sure. Uh, but China, even in Sri Lanka, is about 10, 11 percent of the total debt. OK, it's one of the larger bilateral creditors, but 40 percent of the debt is private bondholders. It's bond markets that are really the problem. These are coming this, through New York, uh, London, New York and uh, London, New York and London. Basically, the Sri Lankan government issued international sovereign bonds. OK, and this has been a story over and over again. Mexico's big debt crisis happened with their sovereign bonds, the Tese Bonos in 1994, if you remember. So bonds are one of the things which react most rapidly to changes in market sentiment because you can sell your bond. Yeah. And so even if it's a long term bond, even if you have to hold, you know, you uh, there's a very 20, 30 year maturity. If there is a bond market in which you can sell, then in fact, because of the coupon rate and so on, it becomes a very high yield for the country. And so it's really changes in the bond market that, that are the most devastating. That was the story even in Greece in 2010 and 2011. So this is what's happening now in many countries, which is that they were encouraged to go to global bond markets. In fact, it was celebrated. The IMF in one of its World Economic Outlooks said, oh, isn't it wonderful that now all these emerging and frontier markets can access long-term debt through the bond market. So. This was done, and now about 40% in Sri Lanka's case, 30% in Ghana's case, half in many other countries' cases, is these bondholders. Now, the trouble with bondholders is that it's really hard to get a restructuring. Right. Because, you know, they can go and 
Some of them can be what are called holdout creditors and they can go and appeal in the court and demand full payment and so on. 95% of these contracts are in London or New York. And it's those laws which dominate. It's those laws which affect you. And we've had cases in Argentina. There was a judge Grisa in the New York court who said, yes, you can take over their assets. Yes, you can grab their planes and their ships wherever you find them. Because so there is a real problem in terms of restructuring with all these private players. It's very intriguing to me that the discussion on restructuring tends to focus on China because it's really an attempt to distract. China is uh, has, has been demanding that, it, yes, it will participate in restructuring, but only if all the creditors mm. participate, right? That everybody has to take a haircut, including the international financial institutions. Like the IMFs. The IMF and the World Bank. Now, they have always maintained that, no, they will never participate. They will never take a haircut because that will affect their credit rating. Right. Okay? That's not strictly true. In the HIPIC, if you remember, the highly indebted poor countries debt initiative in 2001 and then 2004, the um, IMF took, I think, IMF and World Bank together, I think, actually quietly wrote off about 70 billion of credit. That's a lot, huh? even in those mm. days. Unnoticed, and it did not affect their credit rating at all. So mm. it's possible. So this insistence that we will not, I think it's wrong because it also means there is zero accountability for mistakes on the part of the IMF. You right. know, in Sri Lanka, the IMF gave its latest loan before the, this one in 2016, when, frankly, that government was already in a Ponzi scheme. It was already borrowing to repay other debt. And right. the IMF right. knew this. Instead of dealing with that, instead of saying, no, stop that, they do all kinds of other conditions. You know, the usual conditions, privatize this, reduce that spending, which is nonsense. So the IMF is also culpable. It should also take a hit. There should be some accountability for things it does, instead of it being always in this position of power, telling countries what to do and messing it up for them. But anyway, so that's one of the sticking points. But the big issue that is still, if you like, you know, the elephant in the room is the um, the private creditors. And that will not change until you get legislation in New York and London that would actually force private creditors to be part of a deal, of a restructuring deal. Do we need a national le legislation or some sort of international forum to... We would need an international forum, but that forum will have to have the power to override the domestic. Mm. Yeah. So definitely we need an international restructuring mechanism. And this has been a demand now for 20 years and it still hasn't happened, right? We definitely need a global mechanism. But in addition to that, if you don't change those rules... So much of global trade and finance is rooted through dollars or through the London markets. And so these countries will be hit in many different ways. And, and yes, that legislation. So you would have to have very clear statements from the government's concerned that this, this agreement for debt restructuring overrides our domestic laws. Right. I wanted to come back to what you uh, uh, mentioned earlier about uh, the speculative trading uh, in commodities, uh, agrarian and petrochemicals and so on. Um, you say that the war in Ukraine is, uh, is just part of the story. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, speculative market in commodity trading and yes. also what's your assessment about the war in Ukraine and its impact on countries that traditionally uh, import essential commodities particularly not Africa countries like Lebanon which are very highly dependent on wheat oil seeds barley and so on what has been the impact of the war and the struggle to fight uh, poverty and underdevelopment in these countries, but also very briefly about the speculative trading. Okay, so there are two very different questions. Let me take the first one. Uh, the 
food and fuel price increases. It's a replay of what happened in 2007, 2008. I had written about it then, which is that really, this is the result of hectic financial activity in commodity futures markets. So in fact, both fuel and wheat prices, uh, particularly, but also rice and a bunch of others, from January 2007 to the middle of 2008, they just rose dramatically. Okay, I mean, they uh, in the case of wheat, I think they went up by 400%. I mean, massive increases in the price. Okay, and everybody, as usual, said, "Oh, there was a supply issue. Something happened in Canada. Something happened in Australia. You know, the usual kinds of things." In fact, no, global wheat supply did not fall. Okay, aggregate output increased because yes, there's a bad harvest somewhere, there's a good harvest somewhere else. Okay. What did happen was that financial agents started investing in commodity futures markets. And that's because they were losing money now in US subprime. They had mm -hmm. realized that US subprime was no longer viable, right? It was already right. the beginning of the end had started happening. Yeah. Uh, the uh, so they moved into commodity futures and then it becomes the snowball effect, right? The leader goes in, everybody rushes in, the expectations become self-fulfilling, the prices keep rising. And so then more and more people go in. June 20, 2008, a few of the big players decide to move out. Goldman Sachs, bearing, uh, you know, uh, Jamie Dimon and that, what, what's that bank of his, Morgan, J, uh, Chase, JP Morgan JP and so on. Sure. They decide to move out. And that causes the swing. Now, they also move out because they have to cover some of their losses in US subprime now. In other words, that thing has really tanked, right? Mm. Uh, June 2008, already you're getting Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all of them collapsing. Right. And so, so they're covering their losses, they move out, and you get a collapse. By December 2008, prices are back where they were 18 months ago. Okay? No change in global demand or supply. Yeah. The FAO data now for that period, nothing happened. It was increasing by 3-4% in both demand and supply. Okay, Similar thing has happened in the Ukraine war, but even more concentrated, which is that when the war starts, let's say by about January, you get all the media reports, oh my God, Ukraine is such a big wheat producer. Russia is a big fertilizer producer. This is going to affect the... Russia is an oil producer. This is going to affect supplies. So you're creating what is called the mahal, you're creating the environment for an expectation of price rise. And so when prices do rise, nobody objects. Right. The US is a classic example. The US did not, is a not a net importer of fuel, right? It's a net exporter mm. of fuel. Nothing changed in US supply conditions, right. zero. Absolutely nothing changed. Gas prices at the pump go up from $2 to $5, $6. How can that happen? And how is it allowed to happen? It's just them raising prices. That's it. Similarly, the global fuel and food markets, wheat prices escalate, they go through the roof. Oil prices go through the roof. Actually, supplies haven't changed. Russia is still supplying. In fact, it's still supplying the same European countries. It's just routing it through India. <laughs> okay. Supplies don't go down. Wheat... Uh, a little bit is affected in Ukraine, but there are bigger harvests in other parts of the world. So global supply, again, hasn't changed for wheat. Yet, because you've created that, so uh, the investors in commodity futures are able to invest and make quick profits on this anticipation of price rise. And this includes all these, these financial companies, hedge funds, pension funds, everybody's investing. Yeah. In fact, you know, all the, the long contracts, there was one study done for the Paris wheat exchange, 72% of it was done by financial players. Now, why should financial companies buy wheat? They have no interest in wheat. They should not be allowed to buy wheat. Mm -hmm. right? The purpose of the regulation, the Dodd-Frank bill, was to prevent all that, but they made the rules so porous. And then the lobbyists got in and changed it so much that it continues. So it was entirely speculation. Wheat prices today, oil prices today are back where they were before the, oil, the war. But the war isn't over. Nothing has changed in terms of the war. Right. Right. It's all because it, they, they seized the opportunity created by the war to profiteer if you are a food or agribusiness or fuel company or to speculate. And 
what is to me alarming, ridiculous, and sad is that the public, we allow them to do it. Governments hmm. allow them, and the public says, oh, it's because of this, and nothing can be done. So here is the uh, classic failure of the standard demand supply equilibrium. It's The point is that this was not about that. It was entirely right. about these other forces. Profiteering. Uh, profiteering and speculation, financial speculation. And that is still the case. So, you know, the, the argument that therefore you have to push up interest rates and reduce employment and throw people out of jobs to reduce inflation, it's not just ridiculous, it's obscene. Right. <laughs> there are economists um, not on uh, the left of the spectrum, but uh, uh, I'm not thinking about the pure neoliberals as well, but uh, let's say uh, Professor Raghuram Rajan comes to my mind. He would say that we are not sure about our ability to control these financial markets. Uh, when it comes to taxation, for instance, we hear the same thing, that it's not easy because uh, tax can be evaded in so many ways and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you, Thomas Piketty and others, uh, you guys claim that for governments, it's actually easy if they wish to control uh, these financial players, the overfinanced capital. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Why are you so sure that we can control the uh, these uh, big players, uh, capital moving everywhere and so on? Yeah. Okay, let me begin with the tax issue first, and then we'll get on to the yes. finance and regulation. In the case of taxation, you know, when, for example, wealth tax is mentioned, and Piketty, Gabriel Zuckman, everybody has been talking about wealth taxation for a while. The argument is always that, oh, it's too complex, it can't be done, you know, it will cost more to actually implement than you will get in terms of taxation. That's not true, okay? If you actually consider taxing only the extreme wealth, yeah. let's say the top 1%. In the US, it would be, you know, 100 billionaires, uh, that is those who have more than 100 billion, etc. But if you tax only those, it's relatively easy to track the financial assets. And you can simply impose a tax on that value. Now, if you say impose 4% tax, that's the kind of thing that they're facing anyway with market fluctuations. You know, in some years, they lose up to 10, 15% of their wealth because of market fluctuations. In some years, they gain. But it's not something they would notice, really. And it would give you huge dividends. There are estimates that uh, Gabriel Zuckman has done, which are really quite impressive. In India, it was estimated by um, uh, Subramaniam. Also Oxfam. Well, Oxfam, yes. But, yeah. you know, Subramaniam, this economist from MIDS, did a very interesting thing. He took the top dollar billionaires of India. Okay, so nine hundred and sixty-five like now, hundred and sixty-six billionaires. But we are thinking about yeah. the top of them. I'm talking. He did this in 2019. So before oh, so, we get yeah. even more wealth, okay. Yeah. In 2019, yeah. he looked at the top nine hundred and sixty-five families. That's all in a country of one point three billion. Nine hundred and sixty-five families, and he said if you tax four percent of their wealth, you get one percent of GDP. In 2019, now one percent is exactly our total public health spending, center and state governments put together. We would double that with just this small tax, okay? Now, the argument is that, oh, it's incredibly complicated mm -hmm. and it's unfair and so on. On the other hand, we have property tax, which is much more complicated, right? You have to calculate land values, you have to check for appreciation, and we impose pr property tax on everyone including relatively small wealth holders. Somehow that's allowed. Somehow that is not a problem. That's not difficult. Financial uh, assets are much easier to count. Yet we have no such notion of taxing financial assets. So there is a huge, this is really political will. There is no other explanation for the lack of, let's say, wealth taxation. Similarly, to tax the excess profits that have been created in this last period, in the last couple of years, it's a no-brainer, really. You know, These are companies that have made the biggest profits in their history. 
40 for 8 billion, 60 billion. Every time I read the number, it's is higher, right? right? All of these multinationals are raking it in like they have never raked it in. Why not tax that excess profit? Why not say, well, listen, you didn't get this because you became more productive or you had new technology. You got this because prices changed and you manipulated the price. So we're going to tax that. Billionaires Again, will went up during the COVID very massively. Yes, exactly. The margins have exploded, right? So why not tax those excess profits? There is absolutely no justification for not doing that other than the lack of political will because it's not that you can't measure it. They have declared these in their quarterly accounts to shareholders. Just simply tax that. You know? In terms of regulation, and can we actually stop, is the genie out of the bottle in terms of capital right. flows? So here's the thing, you know, in the interwar period of the last century, it's almost a century ago now, again, capital was very mobile, rushing across borders and creating all kinds of difficulties. And it, again, was sem seemed like this was something inevitable. Markets will behave that way. Can't avoid it. Yet, by after the Second World War, pretty much all countries brought in capital controls, including the US, Western Europe. I mean, of course, the Soviet bloc had it and, and China had it. But across the world. The were... time of command economies. Uh, command economies. Well, but it happened even in market economies. It happened in the United States. It happened in Europe, in France, in Germany, everywhere. Right. So, so there were capital controls because it was recognized that this extremely mobile capital is destabilizing and it doesn't actually give you access to long-term investment. Hmm. So it is possible. And there are all kinds of examples of countries that have benefited. Even today, China regulates capital flows. Absolutely. It's doing fine. Thank you, right? Taiwan, China regulated capital flows until quite recently. It has the great advantage that it's not recognized as a country, so it can do a lot more in terms of independent policies. But many countries that have instituted capital flows have still continued to get long-term investment and have not had the volatility that other countries face. Right. Um, I wanted to briefly discuss about these new discussions that we hear about uh, efforts of de-dollarization. Um, you have recently called for a new multilateralism where you have attacked several uh, existing international economic institutions and policies. And de-dollarization has been in the news. The Global Times uh, carried a column recently indicating that a phase has begun from where dollar would gradually uh, lose its hegemonic role in the global economy. Um, this is like indicating there was a time during the uh, uh, gold standard and the role of silver sterling, uh, sorry, pound sterling, and then the dollar and so on. And now we are entering a new phase and we are hearing that because of the sanctions imposed on Russia due to the war, India and Russia has moved towards sort of non-dollar bilateral trading. And there are same uh, talks about Brazil and China and within the BRICS nations and so on. How hopeful are you about uh, uh, these tapes? And uh, does this fit into the sort of larger scheme of things that you are saying? You know, I, I'm very conflicted about this. At one level, I certainly see that this is happening. And I think it, the US has actually been leading that process. <laughs> I never thought, I imagined that if it did happen, that you would get a decline of dollar hegemony, it would happen with Trump, you know, <laughs> with the kinds of America first and inward looking strategies and so on. But in fact, it's the Biden administration that has been leading. And yes, there is the continuing trade war with China, I would call it a technology war rather than a trade war. It's mm. really about who will control the frontier technologies of the future. But uh, the big shift is in terms of the sanctions. So the US had already used sanctions as a political weapon with uh, Iran, Syria, Venezuela. Yeah, But these are relatively small countries with less political voice. Now you do it to Russia. You basically say, well, you've got so many reserves in my in banks in my country, which are legally yours, but I'm not going to give you access. I'm going to take them. Mm 
like they have done with Afghanistan's reserve. And people are starving in Afghanistan, but they're saying, no, we're going to give this to Afghan refugees in the US. I mean, on which principle of international law will allow you to do that, right? So they did this with the, um, the reserves, which already made central banks everywhere in the world sit up and say, oh, they can do that and get away with it. So maybe we shouldn't keep our money in places where it can be accessed so easily and effectively frozen and taken away from us. But the other big thing they did, part of the sanctions, was the SWIFT, right? SWIFT is this system of international payment, which is a, uh, it's a consortium of banks that does it, but it's Western banks. And most global trade has been organized through SWIFT. In fact, they, there are those who argue that, you know, just as container technology was a critical technological input into globalization, it made the emergence of global supply chains possible because suddenly you could import and export larger quantities and volumes very cheaply. Similarly, SWIFT was, if you like, the financial equivalent of that. This is a Swift revolutionary, and... technological revolution. That's right. It, it is absolutely critical in enabling the trade credit and the financing that, in a sense, oiled the wheels of global trade over this period of globalization. Now, suddenly you're saying, well, it's, it's only for my friends. If I decide I don't like you, you don't get access to SWIFT. That, that's huge. That's really saying that you cannot trust me for any of the things on which you have built your trade and financial patterns. So more and more countries are saying, well, we have to have a backup plan. Mm especially not just because I want to continue importing Russian oil, but supposing tomorrow they say, we don't like you either. Then, you know, you don't want to be left without anything. So yes, there are clear moves towards um, these alternative arrangements. And we are going to see whether they are regional blocks or more complicated kinds of arrangements. We're going to see all of that. Now, Having said that, and seeing that this is the writing on the wall, uh, and in a sense, the, the decline of US hegemony is not a bad thing because it hasn't been all that wonderful for much of the world. Right? <laughs> but, uh, but to put it mildly. Is, yeah. <laughs> but the trouble is really the failure of multilateral institutions mm -hmm. because, you know, we do need multilateral institutions. Our problems are international more than ever before. Right? We saw it in the pandemic, which unfortunately was not dealt with in a pro properly international way. But climate change, right? it's not a respecter of borders and passports and visas. Right. It will affect everyone. And you have to deal with it on a global planetary basis. So it is and China true. becomes now, very critical in this. I mean, climate, China, the but climate change. China, yes. But, you know, cooperation is also critical. Cooperation for finance, cooperation for technology and knowledge, cooperation for implementation. You know, all of these are critical. We can't do it without cooperating. Right. And that seems to have gone. That, that to me, that's, it's not just a tragedy, it's scary. <laughs> because the, um, the multilateral system as we know it is either powerless or ineffective or sometimes absolutely counterproductive. Let's admit it. Our institutions are not fit for purpose. They have to be massively revamped. I've, I'm part of a, a commission. I think you mentioned it was the Secretary General set up a board to look at the possibilities for effective multilateralism. And we've made a number of suggestions. Uh, the report will be handed over on the 18th of April. And the idea is really to just completely revamp these institutions because you have to. These are not working right now for our for the kinds of challenges we face and the trouble is that these challenges are not going to go away they will only get worse so we do need to come together to cooperate with a different set of rules and a different set a different priority and manner of functioning of these institutions now you can say it's a pipe dream that is not going to happen given geopolitical tensions given you know the nature of power and all of that but if it doesn't happen, frankly, we're all doomed. So, so we got to hope that it happens somehow or the other. Um, I have two quick questions before I let you go. Um, one is this sort of now general uh, question on the discipline of economics itself. Uh, you've been an economist for a long time. Uh, 
and uh, being a development economics, I can imagine it's a sort of uh, um, mixed road to trads. Uh, yeah. um, so um, after the global financial crisis, this discipline of economics um, has seen uh, increasing attack. Um, Piketty uh, famously insisted that there is nothing such as economics discipline. It's uh, it's a social science discipline and it's sort of inter interdisciplinary. Um, and sociologist uh, Andrea Orlean, I read his book recently, and he has asked other disciplines to take over the task of inter interpreting the economy. Since economists, he wrote, cannot be expected today to teach the opposite of what they professed yesterday. He was, I guess, basically talking against the sort of uh, um, neoclassical economics, but he uses the word economist. And Yanis Varoufakis uh, said that the economy is too important to, to be left to the economist. What are your Actually, thoughts? Actually, I said it before him, by the way. Oh, I'm so sorry the... about it. I read it. <laughs> but it's his... okay. Yanis does that. It's fine. Yeah, I read <laughs> it in his book. So what are your thoughts about the discipline of economics at the moment? You know, I do believe that uh, Mainstream economics has been very much in the service of power. Okay, economics is about politics. It's about distribution. It is about how you organize production. All of these intimately related to power. And so it is unfortunate, but true that mainstream economics has very much, and especially the neoliberal period, has very much followed the requirements and dictates of those who control power. Uh, that is why, in fact, it has been such a strict gatekeeper of alternative thinking. It really, the you know, the mainstream discipline is, it, it's absolutely killing to those who have alternative things. They they will not get published in the so-called top journals. They will not get promoted in or even get tenure in universities. They will not be allowed to teach the most basic economics courses. So there is a real tendency to keep economics into the straight and narrow because it's seen as politically important. On the other hand, it's therefore further and further away from reality, okay? And therefore you have a huge emergence of those who need to actually understand the economy, whether it is the people in business schools, because business needs to understand the economy, or it is students who say, well, listen, this is not why we came to study this. We didn't want to just do some funny little game theoretic, uh, model that has no bearing on what is happening in the world today or a particular randomized trial in one little place in a poor country somewhere where I can get a cute little result. We want to understand the dynamics of the economy, the relationship between states and markets and societies. Mm. What is driving the big things that are happening in the world around us, whether it is an increase in employment, unemployment, inflation, the uh, impact of climate change, the distribution, we want to understand those things. So there is more and more of a movement away from that very um, puerile, uh, uh, what had happened to economics as a at the mainstream discipline. There were always pockets. I, I, I was proud in my earlier university, Jawaharlal Nehru University, where you're also an alumnus. Uh, I was very proud that our department uh, maintained that tradition. I'm happy now at UMass Amherst that there is, again, a strong heterodox tradition, but I think there are more and more people who recognize that, listen, the point of studying this is to actually understand what's going on and to try and do something about it. It's not to just you know, be clever within a very small domain of equally clever people. <laughs> right. Um, a lot of this has to do with the sort of decline of both the Keynesian uh, uh, ec economists and also the sort of uh, general decline of Marxism, perhaps with the 1970s and 80s. Um, I mean, if you read the post-Second World War major institutions, I'm not talking about these uh, smaller institutions, but even MIT, uh, there was a rich uh, Keynesian tradition within that uh, in the Austrian school uh, in Italy itself. There was a rich Keynesian traditions. Now I'm I'm not saying that Keynesians were revolutionary and great, but certainly they had a better understanding perhaps than what happened after the 1980s. I I don't know if I'm right. Well, you know, within Keynesianism also there are many strands, as you probably That's right. know. That's right. And uh, 
there has been an argument that let's say the American um, synthesis, the neoclassical synthesis as it was called, kind of undermined the more progressive elements of mm. Keynesianism or even the more interesting creative elements, you know, that recognized that market financial markets are simply not rational, that, you know, you uh, all kinds of other things play a role. Um, but yes, there has been a systematic tendency to purge economics of all of this content. And that's been the case more and more. It's when you think of the people in the 50s and 60s who were writing, development economists who were very middle of the road, who were certainly not themselves leftist at all. They seem absolutely revolutionary today simply because the entire discipline has moved so far to the other extreme. People like so Charles think, Kindleberger, I recently wrote. Kindleberger, his... absolutely. Kindleberger, I think, is immensely rich and I still go to him. He's my go-to person for understanding, especially global finance still. But, you know, people like Rosenstein Rodin, people mm. like, um, you know, the the, the well-known Hirschman, right? These, these were not seen as radical or leftist or anything. They were very mainstream. Right. Today, they would be seen as, oh, my goodness, you know, you can't say things like that in polite society. <laughs> so there has been such a shift of the entire discipline into a much more... Um, ridiculous faith in markets. And I say ridiculous because especially in your lifetime, you have seen markets fail so completely, Absolutely. so frequently. Yeah. Right. Uh, yet, right. yet there is this clinging on to the idea that yes, you can have um, so-called free markets, which are really markets. Neoliberalism is not about free markets. It's about markets serving large capital and states serving large capital. Yeah. But it's, disguised as being about free markets and therefore it is presented in that way and that has got even stronger the more it becomes evident that it is absolutely not just irrelevant but counterproductive i want to wrap up with uh, a question on uh, the politics of the left since we are a platform uh, on the left and i recently uh, visited your Ralph Miliband lecture and we discussed with some of my comrades. Um, and uh, uh, this is the lecture perhaps you gave at uh, the LAC, London School of Economics, yeah. perhaps a decade ago. And I felt like how incredibly resonating and in many ways it was a prophetic, like the kind of things that you observe, the tendency within the yeah. left, you know, in some ways the decline of the sort of... Uh, more revolutionary transformation or centralized planning, a party leading the fight towards, uh, you know, inclusion, diversity in some ways, but also taking up issues on, um, in, on the environment and so on. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends uh, responded by saying that Professor Ghosh is uh, naive about thinking, uh, taking all these changes to be dynamic because that was one of the words that you yeah. used that there is dynamism in this global left and they said that this is naive because this has if at all anything has weakened the left i wonder what would be your response to that this is such a complex area and you know certainly i was not uh, shall i say particularly prophetic over the next decade because these are all uh, the left in Latin America, which is particularly where I was looking at that point, then went through a phase of you know really Decline. bad times, right? And a large part of the ability to deliver in that period was related to the fact that they were benefiting from commodity booms and they could redistribute more and all of that. So yes, I did fail to recognize this is the, some of those. the previous decade in Latin America. That's then. right, exactly. I was looking at you know that earlier what was called the Pink Revolution right. at the time. I do believe, however, that some of the points that I made are still extremely relevant. I do believe that, and I think I would not say that they are over. Okay, so the idea that everything doesn't have to be large scale and centralized is something that has taken root and is important. I was recently in Brazil and you know they are once again trying to evolve an alternative strategy, once again under Lula. That, that particular idea that you cannot have a very one large centralized solution is very, very clear. 
the other th the respect for ecology and nature that's so major and it it shapes so much of even what is happening in in many of the newly left renewed left mm -hmm. movements in latin america but in other countries as well the recognition that you know it's not just about human beings and our institutions it's really about our relationship with nature and the planet and how we uh, uh, do that the respect for different kinds of differentiation not only the obsession with class as defined by capital and workers but the recognition of unpaid work the especially done by women the recognition of gender differences of how race permeates economies of how other kinds of stratification impact on economies that's again very evident and i think it's all very positive i do see i don't think that there can be a left movement of that very traditional let's face it macho uh, past i think it will have to be a much more fluid movement based on different kinds of coalitions based on recognition of greater differences within those who are impacted by global capital but also recognizing that global capital is the problem so i'm not um I'm not completely ashamed of that argument. I do believe I got some things wrong, but I think there are some essential things that I did get right. And I think they're still valid. Uh, just re as I said, I'm seeing what's happening in Colombia, a country which nobody could imagine you would get a left government. Right. And, you know, so clearly there are all these seeds out there that just need a catalyst to change. I, that gives me hope because, you know, as you know, in South Asia, we're going through bad times. So we're not exactly in a strong position. But I think one of the things that is clear is often change comes from directions that you're not looking at. And so we in the left also have to be a little more humble. It's not always from a de self-declared left movement mm -hmm. that you will get newer leftist or progressive tendencies. And we will have to recognize that we have to have coalitions with all kinds of different groups, uh, but that some of those can actually be fruitful for better societies, better economies. One, uh, and I'm just letting you go with this. One of the yeah. things you said, you observed, I guess, rightly, is that the left movements, the social movements, and uh, even institutions, they are increasingly engaging more with formal institutions. Um, and I'm thinking about, since you have written so much about the green economy, um, how hopeful are you about, because if you look at Germany, for instance, its role of the Green Party, which has become so pro-war, um, and even broadly outside the sort of environmental ecological movement, we have been repeatedly seeing social movements, but our ability to actually engage with formal institution, uh, I'm not sure about that, how much that has increased, if if, if at all the formal institutions from Davos to, um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, UN um, um, Forum for Climate Change and so on are very, very uh, under the control of uh, global capital. So how democratic are these sort of formal institutions, despite this illusion of increasing engagement with formal institution by the left? So, yeah, this is such a difficult question. And I agree, it can be extremely dispiriting, right? You think you get something, but then, of course, the lobbyists move in and change it completely into something else. I mean, even the, the big, the green deal that the European Union has been touting, it's nonsensical. There are more subsidies for fossil fuels. The Inflation Reduction Act in the US, which again has been touted as this hugely green thing and we're all celebrating saying, okay, there are these subsidies for green investment. There are more subsidies for coal and fossil fuels. So yes, there is always, I mean, power always moves in to change things right. in, in its favor, right? And we are seeing this over and over again. So it is one step forward, many steps sideways, a few steps back. It's, it's very much like that. Does it mean that there is no hope and we should avoid engaging with the formal institutions? No, I think mm -hmm. that's the problem. That that was the mistake we made earlier or the left made earlier. That, you know, the only thing is revolution, blow everything up and then there will be, you know, a, a desolate landscape on which we will build. I think history of the 20th century has taught us that that doesn't work either. 
that we really have to be changing things. Yeah, one step at a time, little bits at a time, throwing grains of seeds everywhere in all directions in the hope that something works out and that it won't always be smooth and easy and there will always be pushback. There will always be the empire striking back. Yes, but you have to get more and more people aware of that. And I think there are two aspects there where people like us can play a role. You know, you and I, we have to make more and more people aware of the central issues. I mean, I'm in, you and I are in Northeast US at the moment, right? Supposedly very progressive, aware. We're in university towns, uh, surrounded by people who know. Most of them don't know. Most of them don't even know that inflation is not the result right. of, right. you know, rising wages or too much demand. Most of them don't know even that the US was obscene in terms of the whole attitude to COVID-19 vaccines. Right. That it gave money to companies and then allowed them to profit even right. off US taxpayers. So they gave money three times over. First for the subsidy for the vaccine development, then to buy the vaccines, then to buy the boosters, which at double the price. These are taxpayers' money. And then they prevented them from providing them to the rest of the world. So most of them don't even know this. So one job we really have is to get all of this basic information across, I think. We have to go out there and keep talking, writing, shouting, doing whatever we can, I think. Just getting basic information across. I, that's a, a very critical thing. The other is, I think, among progressives, we often miss, you know, we like to talk in, in big. Right. Um, yeah, we, we, even our discussion, right, has been big. It's been <laughs> on the big issues. And it's good. We need to have the big. But we also need to have the very specific demands. You know, uh, Fridays for the Future uh, was great. And it's wonderful. It brought out so many people. But every Friday, they just said, do something. They didn't say, do mm -hmm. this specific thing or don't do this specific thing. We need to be much more specific in demands to make governments feel, okay, this one we better not do. You know, so we have to, first of all, get everyone aware of broader issues. But secondly, we do have to have very specific demands, which they have to come up with good reasons why they can't do it. Why isn't there a whole movement about excess profits, for example? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing also we should focus on. I recently read a book on the, the People's Republic of China and particularly uh, the Cultural Revolution. And when you said that we have to come get over this obsession of blowing everything up, yeah. it just struck me because how good Mao was in terms of movements. In fact, Joel, Andres, uh, jo Joel Andreas, uh, the author of the book, eventually mm -hmm. says that Mao was great in times of movements. He was a man of movement, but he was not a man of institution. Um, mm. and it just struck me when you said that yeah. um, Professor Jayati Ghosh thank you so much for your time it was such a, such a privilege to have you with us well thank you that was a very interesting discussion thank you for having me